Hello everyone and welcome to another Left Book Club event. Tonight we'll be discussing Murray Bookchin's Ecology of Freedom with some really incredible guests all under one virtual roof. So we're really happy that you're all already have joined us and for everyone who will join us later today or watch this talk at another day. Um, the Left Book Club is a subscription book club and not-for-profit initiative. We seek to foster a spirit of collective learning and political education. We aim to create spaces and avenues where people can learn from each other and discuss radical ideas that inform actions and practical steps with the goal of supporting the struggles fighting for us all. The Left Book Club events have featured some phenomenal discussions over the last few months. Feel free to check out the video library on our YouTube channel for discussions engaging with a wide range of radical thought. Tonight, don't forget to ask your questions on the live YouTube live stream chat that you're watching us on right now. If you would like to become a member of the Left Book Club, please visit leftbookclub.com or alternatively, you can start by subscribing to our mailing list, which is in the description of the YouTube live stream you're watching right now. Don't forget to follow the Left Book Club on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook to keep up to date with our events, discussions and other work that we will be doing. Um, just a very quick reminder, um, our guests today um, are joining from various parts of the world. And if the stream or the Internet connection goes a bit choppy, don't worry, it will come back. So stay with us if that happens. So a bit about this event. This is something that's quite close to my heart personally, so I'm really happy and really excited to be uh, chairing and moderating this discussion. Uh, we were joined by and with Debbie Bookchin, Dan Chodokov and David Wengro for a discussion on Murray Bookchin's theory for the way to, and quotes, a sane, sustainable and ecological future. And we may not be able to get into every detail of it on this talk, but the idea of the event will be to give an overview of Bookchin's exploration of the first emergence of human culture to today's globalized capitalism and how the book and the work and the work that has also come from it can be a very crucial resource for an understanding of this way or a new way to an alternative way to organize our world. So Dan Chodokov, PhD, is a cultural anthropologist who specializes in urban anthropology and utopian studies. He co-founded the Institute for Social Ecology with Murray Bookchin in 1974. He has been active in a wide range of movements for ecologically oriented social change over the past 50 years and is the author of two novels, I'm probably not going to pronounce this properly, but Loisida and Sugaring Down and a collection of essays, The Anthropology of Utopia. Debbie Bookchin is a longtime journalist and author who has won awards for her news, features and investigative reporting. She has reported and written for a number of publications, including The New York Times, The Atlantic, The New York Review of Books and The Nation and co-edited her father's book of essays, The Next Revolution, Popular Assemblies and the Promise of Direct Democracy. She served for three years of, as Bernie Sanders' press secretary when he was first elected to Congress from Vermont. She is currently active in the municip municipalist movement and in the emergency committee for Rojava, which she co-founded to support Kurdish autonomy and democratic confederalism in Rojava and Turkey. David Wengro is a professor of comparative archaeology at the UCL Institute of Archaeology and has directed excav excavations of prehistoric sites in Iraqi Kurdistan. And with David Graeber, he co-authored many articles and their forthcoming book, The Dawn of Everything, which will be published later this year. Um, so this is the lineup we have today. And without further ado, I wanna go to Dan first for, um, for a presentation and hopefully a bit of a general explanation of the ecology of freedom. Over to you, Dan. Hello, uh, pleasure to be with you all this afternoon, or I guess it's this evening for many of you. I'm coming to you from Marshfield, Vermont, a small rural village uh, with a population of about 1300 people. 
not far from Plainfield, Vermont, which is where Murray Bookchin and I co-founded the Institute for Social Ecology in 1974. I'm really pleased to see the ecology of freedom getting the kind of thorough examination that it deserves. It's in many ways, I think, Bookchin's most important work. And to my mind, Murray Bookchin is one of the most important social theorists of the 20th century and certainly has a lot to teach us here in the 21st century. Bookchin was really a prescient thinker. He began to write about ecological issues back in 1950s. In 1954, he published his first book length article, which was actually published as a book in Germany, uh, examining the impact of chemicals in our food system. And once again, he was prescient. He was way ahead of the curve. Ecological issues were hardly on anyone's radar back in the 50s. He published another important book called Our Synthetic Environment uh, under the pseudonym Lewis Herber six months before Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, which is often acknowledged as the document, the book that really gave impetus to the modern environmental movement. Bookchin's work, of course, unlike hers, was really concerned with examining the social roots of the environmental crisis. He wasn't simply talking about the impact of DDT on bird, bird populations, as important that that is, but he tried to understand what, the process was that brought us to the point where we were using all of these toxic chemicals in our environment. And he understood the implications that ecology had for revolutionary thought. In 1964, he actually published an essay called Ecology and Revolutionary Thought, in which he warned of the dangers of global climate change, uh, once again, way ahead of his time. At that point, he suggested it might be 200 years in the future if we failed to curb emissions of greenhouse gases. And of course, he was not taken seriously. In fact, in some quarters, he was ridiculed uh, for that statement, but he's turned out to unfortunately have been right on the mark. Ecology of freedom plays a very important role in the genesis of Bookchin's work. Uh, in many ways, it is his magnum opus. It's a book, a work in which he lays out in a comprehensive fashion the themes that he will essentially spend the rest of his life uh, developing and elaborating. It's a work which draws primarily on anthropology and philosophy and history, uh, but like social ecology itself, it also draws on biological science, it draws on critical social theory. Uh, he comes out of both the Marxist tradition and the anarchist tradition. And it's a work that attempts to help us understand the emergence of hierarchy, the kinds of social changes that were required in order for us to arrive at where we are now. Uh, it takes a very critical view, of course, of both capitalism and the nation state. Uh, but beyond that, and I think this is really one of the most remarkable aspects of the book, it's also very suggestive in terms of the direction that we need to move if we are to reharmonize people and nature. And ultimately, that is the goal of Bookchin's social ecology. It's a, a revolutionary reharmonization of people and nature, which will allow for the emergence of what Bookchin called third nature or free nature, uh, in which humans represent nature becoming self-conscious, nature aware of itself. Uh, he drew, and, and I'm not sure whether you have been reading the first edition or the second edition of the book. And I think it would be interesting to know because there is a significant difference between the two. And that relates primarily to the introduction. In the introduction to the first edition, uh, Bookchin enthuses over certain characteristics of what he calls organic society or pre-literate society. He recognizes their qualitatively different attitude towards nature, uh, the way in which their lack of a high, true social hierarchy, the egalitarian nature of their society uh, prevented them from really developing the concept of domination in relation to the rest of nature. And he sees that as significant, as admirable, and is something which is really a source of hope for us in the future. 
not in the sense that he wishes us to return to hunting and gathering. He certainly didn't. He recognized ways in which the artifice of civilization, technology, agriculture, the development of communication systems and all of that, of course, have the potential to benefit humanity tremendously. But rather, he felt that in that civilizational process, something was lost as well. And he really describes both the emergence of hierarchy and the emergence of concepts of freedom. And in the ecology of freedom, he sees them as being inextricably linked. He once in conversation described to me the process of the emergence of freedom as existing in a almost a double helix kind of relationship to the emergence of hierarchy. That they feed off of each other. And ultimately, of course, he looked towards a day in which hierarchy would be dissolved, the dissolution of hierarchy and its replacement by egalitarian relationships between people and a qualitatively different kind of relationship between people and the natural world. Uh, he draws very heavily on anthropology in this exploration. He looks at preliterate people or what he calls organic society drawing on much of the work of critical anthropology, people like Paul Radin, Dorothy Lee, Stanley Diamond, uh, some of that earlier generation of primarily Marxist-oriented anthropologists. But of course, he rejects the Marxian framework as being too limited. Uh, he makes the distinction between Marx's emphasis on the category of exploitation and class division and replaces that with a broader understanding of domination uh, as an expression of hierarchy and hierarchies of all types, it's not simply class distinctions and the domination of one economic group over another, but also the kinds of hierarchy that exists between men and women, uh, between various ethnicities, the hierarchy which he sees first emerging really as an expression of a gerontocracy, that which he sees initially as an incipient form of hierarchy that then elaborates and grows and finds expression in many different forms in many cultures around the world. And he takes us on a remarkable journey. In the book, he really begins with some very basic ideas concerning nature, how we define nature, uh, epistemologically, if you will. He develops an ethics, an ethical framework, which he derives from his understanding of nature. Uh, it's a comprehensive philosophy. And one of the things that Bookchin has emphasized throughout his work is the idea of coherence. The fact that he is trying to help us make sense out of what are seemingly or what can seem to be random events. He places everything within evolutionary and dialectical framework. He sees nature and society as not static or fixed, but rather as emergent. And he sees a certain directionality in the evolution, both of first nature and of humanity or what he terms second nature. And that directionality is an evolution towards ever greater degrees of complexity diversity and freedom. So it's really, I think, one of the first attempts since Marx to create this kind of systematic understanding of the world that we live in. He really does take us from step A to step Z, and he does it in a, in a rather in a poetic fashion. And it's interesting because it's a work, as I said, primarily of anthropology and philosophy, but it is also a work of poetry. He uses language in very evocative ways. He's able to bring some of the passion that he felt around these issues to bear in the work. And at the same time, maintains a very rigorous <coughs> kind of scholarship. But it's scholarship which is not simply academic in nature. And I think that's something else I would emphasize. Bookchin's project was not simply a philosophical project or an anthropological project, certainly not an academic project. It was a project which he saw as providing essential ideas that could help people to shape social movements that could bring about the kind of society that he envisioned. He was very much a man committed to the notion of praxis, the idea that the theory alone really meant little, that it needed to be applied in the world, 
that the experience of those applying these ideas needed to be re-examined and re-evaluated if necessary, the theory needed to develop. So throughout his life, there was this very dynamic approach to social theory. And he did change his point of view uh, several points through his life. He went through a personal evolution beginning when he was a kid back in the 1930s during the depression uh, in the communist party, starting with the youth group, became disillusioned with the party, became a Trotskyite uh, by the 1960s or really late 50s, he'd begun to turn towards anarchism. He later rejected anarchism. So there is this ongoing journey through various isms of the left in books and the biography that's reflected in his work as well. And for me, that's a great strength of both Murray's work and his life. And it's exemplary, the fact that he was able to continue to develop, to continue to grow, to stay true to his basic beliefs, but also to examine them critically. Uh, I think that's another important point I would offer. He operates really through the negative dialectic, and this becomes clear as you read The Ecology of Freedom. Uh, he's very concerned with critically understanding what is, but teasing out of what is what could be and what should be. So there is also a unabashedly utopian dimension to his work. And of course, the concept of utopia has fallen into disfavor. These days, we use the word primarily as a pejorative or dismissive. But the reality is that there is a long history and tradition of utopian social thought, uh, which has been a crucial component, really, of left thinking forever. You know, it be books and traces it back really to the earliest days of hunting and gathering bands. The expression of utopia and then was a harking back to the hunting and gathering time, the period known as the <clears throat> golden age, period of great abundance when hunting and gathering, at least in, in the myths that were told around the campfires, was more a process of, of harvesting the riches of nature rather than an arduous hunt. He sees the transformation of that ideal in various ways, finding expression in religious eschatology, study of the end times, looks at the Anabaptist movements and Gnostic Christianity, ways in which they tried to create the kingdom of heaven here on earth. He traces that same tendency through the utopian socialists of people like Charles Fourier in Saint-Simon in France, Robert Owen in Italy. Uh, and then of course he examines the left movements that emerged in the 19th century and gave secular expression to these utopian ideals. And he uses utopia as a way to transcend the given, a way to help us think beyond what is to what could be and what should be. At the same time, rooting that development in real existing potentiality. So this is not the utopia of cloud cuckoo land, the utopia that can never be. This is rather a utopia which Bookchin sees as being within our grasp, as being rooted within the depths of our own humanity, really, as growing out of that urge, that essential animating principle that Ernst Bloch called the principle of hope that belief that life can be better. And even Bookchin's utopia is emergent. It's not static. It's something which recedes to the horizon as we approach it. And it's continually developing and continually growing. And that for me is one of the great strengths of this book that he manages to incorporate all of that, all of these various themes into one coherent statement. And it's a statement which, as I said at the start, he really elaborates throughout the rest of his life in the 25 some books which he published and the countless articles. Books and also I would add, and this is not uh, necessarily uh, expressed in the ecology of freedom, but Bookchin was a, a, an ongoing activist as well. He wasn't simply a thinker. He was someone who insisted on putting these ideas into action in various social movements, uh, ranging from the anti-war movement and the civil rights movements of the 60s, the labor movement of the 30s. Uh, he was involved in virtually all of the important social movements that occurred during his lifetime and was a tremendous influence on them too. The whole horizontal form of organization that we see predominating in social movements today is really largely an outgrowth of Bookchin's work. 
Uh, you know, we when I first became active back in the 60s, uh, leftist organizations were still generally organized on hierarchical lines, if not party lines. There was always a director or a president and, and a, a whole hierarchy and bureaucracy that was elaborated out of that. And of course, beginning really with the anti-nuclear movement, we saw a very different model of virgin. It was one that was based on Bookchin's research uh, on the Spanish anarchist movement, his work looking at the collectives in Spain, his work suggesting that the affinity group model uh, could serve as a model for contemporary social movements. It was adopted by the anti-nuclear movement, the idea of affinity groups, and spokes councils, and <clears throat> general assemblies making all decisions uh, was something which then became commonplace. And now we simply assume that's the way that social movements are organized. And it's something that he really never received credit for. Uh, and I think that credit is long overdue. So once again, I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm very pleased to see people examining this work in depth and taking it seriously. And we hope that we can all take lessons that we learned from this work and apply them in our own lives and in our own social movements. And I think I've probably gone 15 minutes, so I'll end here, pass it on. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dan. I think, yeah, I mean, there's so much to kind of discuss even from the 15 minutes you just presented to us but what I really like from it is like what is what could be and what should be and I think there's even just that phrase alone there's a lot to kind of unpack and uncover from that but thank you very much for your presentation and over to you Debbie. Thank you Elif and thank you everybody who's listening and thank you to the book club for selecting this book which as Dan said I think really is such an important uh, uh, volume and it's a pleasure to be here with with Dan and with David. I guess just to sort of you know follow up a little bit on what Dan was saying you know one of my father's principal projects was trying to ground his ideas about society and freedom on an objective basis in other words to try to derive an ethics that could provide a framework for our decision about how we choose to organize society. And the ecology of freedom is really foundational to that effort because he's asking some fundamental questions you know, about human beings, about human nature, and, and about how, how fundamentally we can intervene in nature in a rational way. And for him, the imperative to create an egalitarian society stems from a recognition that it is the most obvious rational choice, that if we look at nature dialectically and see it as an unfolding of ever greater consciousness and think about what role human beings have, we can say that there is a tendency in nature towards ever greater complexity and diversity, and even in the form of human beings, towards reason of reason with human beings serving as a kind of example of nature rendered self-conscious, or, or as he says in the book, potentially conscious, because we don't, we don't necessarily act in the, in the most uh, rational way right now under capitalism and the society that we live in. But, but he believed that humanity really has a vast capacity to alter nature, but is itself a product of nature and doesn't have to be in opposition to nature. And right now, human nature, or what he called second nature, referring to the cultural and social and political aspects of, of life, we are sort of you know, distorted by capitalism, by private property, by the state, the hierarchical relations, domination, and of course also class economic issues. But if you look at nature as striving toward ever greater complexity, consciousness, and subjectivity, you can see the imperative for human beings to take another path altogether. And when you look at it this way, it, it becomes an, a moral responsibility that we have as beings to steward nature. It's in a sense the role that we were made for to intervene in the natural world by creating societies of ever greater diversity, cooperation, creativity, and freedom. 
in other words, ecological, socialist, feminist societies built on democracy, direct democracy. So really we are nature with a higher consciousness. And he focuses on that, that sense of diversity and complexity and mutuality in nature because it kind of serves in part as a model for how people can live together. And so we have that potentiality to reflect back on nature and act rationally, which is not to mystify early societies as, as, as Dan was mentioning. And like David Wengro and David Graeber in their forthcoming book, The Dawn of my father really, you know, wants to think of human society not as just falling from some sort of idyllic state of equality in prehistory, because there was no simple trajectory from one direction to the other. You know, just as as the I will call them the Davids <laughs> point out in their book, just you know, there there was no reason necessarily to believe that small scale groups were all especially likely to be a egalitarian. My father writes that there's nothing inherently liberatory about small scale technology. Its value is really entirely dependent upon the society in which it's put to use. But there are values that we see in early societies, like for example, use of the idea that the possession of an object is transferred from person to person, depending on who has use of it. And the irreducible minimum that everyone in a community is entitled to food and shelter and clothing. And values from nature like diversity and equilibrium that we can and must really begin to extend to our own human societies. So he really wants to think about how we can reinvent ourselves by recapturing the legacy of freedom that existed alongside the legacy of domination. And for him, the way we do this is by creating a domain that allows us to re-empower ourselves. We, for, for my dad, we, he felt, you know, we really have to give institutional form to freedom by creating spaces where people can interact on a face-to-face -face basis in non-hierarchical formations like people's assemblies. He discusses this, of course, in much greater length um, in his book, From Urbanization to Cities, which I'm excited to say is coming out in a new edition in the fall. Um, and, and he, he in that book and in other places, uh, he really elaborates this whole concept of what he calls libertarian municipalism as a way of really, truly, completely reinventing politics and really giving new me meaning to the human experience. And if I may add, this is why the revolutionary project in Rojava is so important, because in that, in that um milieu where the Kurds live in a, with other many other ethnicities, they're really working on founding a society that is completely uh, opposite to the kind of society we live in, you know, where we have patriarchy and a rapacious attitude towards the natural world and complete state violence everywhere we look. The people of Rojava are building a society based on women's liberation and ecology and direct democracy, the polar values that, that, that dominate the society that we live in or maybe that we endure. So one of the things I just wanted to um, perhaps close by saying is I think it's imperative for people to support this project. In many ways, many of the ideas in the ecology of freedom are sort of living and breathing in this Kurdish project in Rojava. And um, is, as I'm sure many people know, is uh, under great threat by Turkey. Uh, so, uh, you know, we we everywhere we can, I think, support uh, the, the people who are trying to build a new world. It's a, very important to do so. And I'll just close on that for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Debbie. Um, yeah, I think especially the emphasis on practice, which hopefully we will discuss a little bit further in the discussion is really, really crucial. Um, yeah, without further ado, David, over to you. 
Thanks, Elif, and thank you, Debbie, and Dan, for including me in the discussion today. It's a real honor for me. And um, I jotted down some thoughts about reading An Ecology of Freedom, and it was very nice for me to listen to Dan talking from up close uh, about the, some of the processes that led to that book, because they resonated with my recollection as an archaeologist of, of reading it for the first time, which uh, I must admit was some years ago, and being struck um, not just by Murray Bookchin's breadth of intellect and that extraordinary turn of phrase uh, that Dan referred to, but mainly for me, the way that his mind would, would just glide back and forth between prehistory and the present in, in a, a kind of seamless way. It's like he had a mental picture of it all, the whole vista of human history, what the key transitions were, that kind of coherence, uh, as Dan, uh, I think, called it. Now, admittedly, it was a little bit easier to do that in 1982 uh, than it is in 2021 because there, there was just less information. Um, I mean, there's, there's just an extraordinary, it's been an extraordinary process of producing new information about human societies over the last three, four decades. You know, David used to joke that we may not be encountering alien races in, in outer space, but we're encountering lots of alien societies under our own feet that nobody even suspected uh, were ever there through my discipline, archaeology and other means. So today it would admittedly take a bit of a lunatic or maybe two lunatics to even attempt uh, something as encompassing as, as, as the ecology of freedom. Um, and, and we, we tried. <laughs> uh, <laughs> me and, and our late friend, who I know you, uh, you all wish as much as I do could be here today talking with us about social ecology and human history and all the rest of it. But in his absence, um, I'm going to try and reflect a bit on my own impressions of the ecology of freedom, what I think um, we learned from it. David, of course, was engaged with, with Bookchin's work far longer than, than me. And to some extent, the parts we don't take up or, or perhaps try to modify in, in a different direction in light of some of this new information which has come out of subjects like uh, anthropology, archaeology, ethno-history since it was written. And of course, we will never know what Bookchin would have made of the, the directions we go in. Um, but let me try. And I, I thought it would be interesting to start with what we retain. And in thinking about this, I was led to wonder uh, what might Murray Bookchin have made of a concept like the Anthropocene? which maybe other people have speculated on this or even written about it, uh, this idea that we've entered a new geological epoch in which, uh, for the first time ever, human agency is the main thing driving the Earth system and driving the process of global climate change. This has become a bit of an intellectual sport, uh, rather distasteful sport, in my opinion, in my own field and also in the field of geography of archaeologists and geographers sort of batting back and forth about when exactly does the Anthropocene kick in and replace the Holocene. And I mean, the range of possibilities currently on offer in scientific journals goes all the way from the Industrial Revolution back to sort of the Neolithic, which to my mind either suggests that the underlying science isn't very good uh, or perhaps the conceptual framework is just a bit weak. Uh, I suspect the latter. What would Bookchin have said about a concept that effectively pits all of humanity against all of nature as conceptual opposites to identify a, a threshold, the dawn of this new geological epoch, the end of the Holocene, the beginning of the Anthropocene? Again, one can only guess, but to make an informed guess, I suppose we have to go back to his key idea that throughout the course of human history, concepts of nature were invariably shaped in a, in a dialectical fashion by human relationships with other people. In which case, the answer may be fairly simple. 
the concept of the Anthropocene, like any concept that juxtaposes all of humanity to all of nature, is a product of our time, a time in which relations of class domination and any critical scrutiny of the capitalist system has become all but muted, in which any critical analysis of relations of power and structural domination are largely replaced by timid appraisals of inequality indexes and Gini coefficients. In short, an age in which it's considered perfectly legitimate for academics to implicate all of humanity, the whole lot in equal measure, those driving and controlling the systems of production and extraction and consumption, together with the workers who produce and the dispossessed who are exploited but rarely consume, to implicate all of us equally in our current catastrophic situation. It won't surprise you then that we don't spend very long in the book, the new book, agonizing about when the Anthropocene started. What we do do instead, and I think uh, some of this at least uh, is indeed owed to Bookchin, is to think a lot about the underlying social structures and arrangements that made the current situation possible and how those arose. And here, in a modest way, we do try to put the ecology of freedom to new use, not so much as a projection into the future, uh, the idea of what some future society based on principles of social ecology might look like, but actually as a historical reality that Bookchin himself couldn't possibly have been aware of in the 1970s or 80s because the evidence just wasn't there to support it. In fact, at that time, the dominant paradigm for historical ecology was the sort of thing to be found in the work of the geographer, Alfred Crosby, whose book Ecological Imperialism was highly influential and arguably preceded uh, the argument of Jared Diamond's hugely successful Guns, Germs and Steel. It's basically the same argument. As the title suggests, uh, Ecological Imperialism, Crosby's book was about how the story of human history can be told as a story of conquest, the conquest of hunter-gatherers by farming populations beginning back in prehistory and ending with the foundation of what Crosby called Neo-Europes, which were created when European colonists unleashed sheep and goat and cattle and wheat uh, and all the rest of it onto the landscapes of Oceania and the Americas, effectively producing replicas of their home environments on foreign soil, and of course in the process wiping out much of the indigenous human populations along with the native flora and fauna. And for Crosby, this is all just the logical culmination of a much longer process that had been going on since the beginning of the Holocene era with the onset of the old world Neolithic and the fertile crescent of the Middle East and the original Neolithic domestication of plants and animals around 10,000 years ago, and which presumably ends with something like the Anthropocene whenever we choose to begin that. Today, with hindsight, I think we can see that this telling of human history and human ecology as a story of imperialism going back thousands and thousands of years falls squarely into the category of what Murray Bookchin called biological materialism, a reductionist view of the past, and I'm quoting here, which validates the status quo, accepts it as given, and fixes it eternally in the genetic material of humanity. That's Bookchin. But what should come in its place? The answer that we propose uh, in the middle chapters of The Dawn of Everything is something that might just as well be called the ecology of freedom. And in fact, that's actually what we call it uh, after Bookchin. Uh, what we try to show in those uh, two chapters of the book is actually how the fate of the world's earliest farming communities, those Neolithic peoples of the Fertile Crescent, but also a whole bunch of other regions, the Lapita peoples of island Oceania, the first cattle herders in Africa, and so on, that what happened there didn't really hinge on their ability to 
outproduce or overcome hunter-gatherers. In fact, those populations which invested most heavily in agriculture, focusing on a very narrow set of uh, domestic crops and animals, the first Neolithic farmers of Central Europe are a great example of this, they often suffered a very cruel fate. Actually, in some cases where they had this very narrow ecological focus, it was actually the farmers, not the hunter-gatherers, whose populations collapsed or descended into feuding and warfare. Actually, what the evidence shows you today is that Neolithic farming was an experiment that could fail, and it often did. And in fact, what we learn is that those Neolithic populations that actually endured and expanded often over really great territories were actually the ones that least resemble modern peasant societies. If we define peasants like uh, the anthropologist Eric Wolf did, uh, I think he called them people existentially involved in cultivation. Existentially involved in cultivation. So the ecology of freedom, uh, we also call it play farming, uh, play farming in the book, is exactly the opposite of that condition. And it turns out to have been a very successful alternative. As we use the phrase, the ecology of freedom describes this proclivity of human societies to move freely in and out of farming, so to farm without fully becoming farmers, to raise crops and animals without surrendering all of one's existence to the rigors of agriculture, to retain a food web that's broad enough to stop cultivation becoming a matter of life or death. And it's just that sort of ecological flexibility that tends to get written out of conventional narratives of world history, which present, you know, the, the planting of a single seed as if it's a point of no return. In fact, as it turns out, moving freely in and out of farming or hovering on its threshold is something our species has done successfully for a very large part of its history. These fluid ecological arrangements combining garden cultivation, flood retreat farming on the margins of lakes or springs, small scale landscape management, burning, pruning, terracing, and the corralling or keeping of animals in semi-wild states, combined with a whole spectrum of hunting, fishing, and collecting activities were once typical of human societies in many parts of the world. And often these activities were sustained for thousands of years and not infrequently, and this is a key point, they supported really large, dense populations, even cities. And as we try to show, they were also crucial to the survival of those first human populations that did incorporate domestic plants and animals. So it's actually biodiversity, not biopower, that is the initial key to the growth of Neolithic food production. There's a lot more I could say about our attempt at a, a version of the ecology of freedom, especially the importance of seasonal variations and this amazing propensity of early human societies to move between very different social and political arrangements, effectively switching fluidly and consciously between completely different social worlds, depending on the time of year and the periodic distribution of resources in the landscape. There's also something important to be said about gender relations and how that whole ridiculous fable about how we didn't domesticate wheat, but wheat domesticated us to be found in the, the works of Yuval Harari and others uh, is basically just a modern retelling of the biblical Garden of Eden story that completely eradicates the contribution of women to ancient science. But let's leave that aside for discussion or some later occasion. Thank you very much. I think I'll stop there if that's okay. Thank you very much for that, David. I mean, I think um, Dan, Debbie, David, this has been a really, really enriching um, contribution to the discussion. Um, I'm quite mindful of the time, so I'm initially going to use my power as chair and moderator to ask some questions. And um, I want to begin with some of the things 
something you said, David, of Bookchin's ability to glide through prehistory and the present, which I think is, I think is a very beautiful way of putting it. And you know, you made the references about about like this this discussion around like turning points in history or like this focus on that. And what I wanted to what I wanted to ask all three of you actually was um was what your thoughts were on or a bit more of a reflection on the use of mythology because this is something that you know Bookchin refers to a lot this is something that uh, Abdullah Öcalan refers to a lot which you know Debbie referred to um as as a place you know the Roger revolution as a place in which some of these ideas are being practiced um and especially uh, it's it's something that is really crucially um, and strategically used by the Kurdish women's movement, the use of mythology. But of course, throughout history, and especially um, particularly in the 20th and 21st century, mythology has been used for the quite the opposite reason. So I guess kind of my reflection and question is, you know, what, what do you have to say about the use of mythology for freedom versus the use of mytholo mythology to justify the now, which is capitalist modernity. And maybe we'll just go in the opposite order. And I don't know, Dave, David, should we start with you? Sure. Um, yeah, well, as you can probably, I should say this book isn't actually out yet, um, but one of the few people who's read it made a comment, which I, I thought summed it all up and kind of partly answers your question about mythology. Uh, he said, it's, it's like reading science fiction, but the fiction turns out to be our conventional view of world history. So myth obviously is not bad science. Uh, all human societies have science and all human societies have some version of myth, right? Um, the question is determining which is which. And I, I think um, the interesting thing uh, about the point we're at in terms of uh, where we've got to with actually understanding human history is that we can actually begin to expose some of these axioms of what's traditionally been referred to as social science as myths. It's an extraordinary moment. You know, the, the fulcrum, the, like, the main turning points, the idea of, uh, you know, the origins of private property with agriculture, uh, the association between urban life and hierarchy, all of these things around which so-called science, social science, has always revolved, the idea of egalitarian hunter-gatherers, um, are just falling to bits in front of our eyes. So very rapidly, I think what we're seeing um, is a process that probably doesn't happen that often, where what is taken as fact uh, is actually becoming myth. Um, one then has um, the, um, the larger question of what, what then, you know, what then comes in its place? Is it still then possible to uh, tell the human story on a similar scale, or will we simply be creating new myths? And I have some thoughts on on that as well, but maybe I, I should shut up at this point and let someone else talk. Thank you, David. Um... Debbie, I think one of the, because I, I think it would be really important to hear your reflections on this kind of question, especially in terms of um, the question of liberation of women and particularly, um, you know, I guess relate to something you said about recapturing the legacy of freedom and what has in some ways existed throughout history in parallel to what, what kind of, can kind of be broadly referred to as capitalist modernity? Well, you know, I mean, I think that it's, it, it's funny. I, I think that sometimes, you know, mythology obviously can be used in different ways, depending on who is using it, what the mythology is about, and you know what what circumstances basically it's being employed for, and you know I am sort of I I remember actually my father once saying 
something when somebody said to him something like it was about religion. Similarly, somebody said, well, you know, religion is as Marx said. And my father said, yes, but religion is also a reflection of people's highest aspirations. And so in that sense, sort of you, if you can look at it kind of dialectically and similarly with mythology, I think that, you know, there have been aspects of mythology that have been very beneficial for the women's movement in terms of empowering uh, uh, how women, in terms of how they think about themselves. And I think at the same time that, you know, we have to be careful when examining mythology not to essentialize uh, women. And so it, it really is one of those um, sort of things that has to be addressed in context and dialectically. And I think that, um, that, you know, he, as you know, he opens the book with the story of the Norse, uh, the great Norse, the book with a beautiful paragraph at the end, which perhaps maybe we can even read at the end that refers again back to that mythology, but urges us to think for, for about how we can really create a future that does not end up in flames and that uh, in a sense transcends the, you know, the, the, the very possible outcomes that, that, that we have to contend with and supersede. Thank you very much for that, Debbie. Um, Dan, you, when you were speaking, you said something um, about that, especially, well, Bookchin's work, but particularly the ecology of freedom allows us or, yeah, allows us to make sense or he makes sense of seemingly random events um, in a, in a very kind of like, you know, you also describe some of his work as like poetic or a work of poetry rather. I mean, I guess also considering that, what what would you have to say or what would your reflections be on the use of mythology? Well, I think mythology is a two-edged sword, uh, at least a multi-edged sword, let's say. I don't wanna set up any any dualisms or false dichotomies here. But on the one hand, uh, we've seen certainly in our society, how mythology is used to reinforce the existing social order. Uh, you know, for example, there is a myth that human nature can be narrowly defined and it consists of our tendency to be competitive, to be acquisitive, to be violent, uh, to be individualistic, and that is seen as an expression of an immutable human nature and it's reinforced by a whole mythology that particularly in America revolves around the, the lone pioneer on the frontier and, and you know, achieving everything by their own labor. And, it, and it's really a way that we reinforce the existing social order and justify capitalist and status relations. Uh, on the other hand, there's another use of myths that can help us to understand the reality that we face and transform it. And, and those myths are not necessarily telling the truth, but they are reflecting something about the human condition and the human potential. And they can serve as a point of inspiration or a way of educating people. Uh, you know, it, it, we don't have to be completely literalist in our approach to social change. And I think it's important that we have some myths that we can look to that can provide us with a sense of hope uh, and perhaps even show us some potential directions that we can begin to move in. So, uh, you know, in that sense, I think mythology can play a very positive and, and help us in the reconstructive project that's really at the heart of social ecology. You know, it's very important and it certainly flies in the face of most people's experience in the existing society, but it's very important for us to maintain a belief that things can be different, that in fact there is a qualitatively different set of relationships and institutions that human society can be based on. So that may uh, be best reflected in, a, in some kind of a story. You know, we respond as people often to stories. And this is why actually I've been writing fiction instead of academic 
works because I feel that there is a power in storytelling and mythology is of course the archetypal form of storytelling. So in that sense, I, I love the idea of us making use of myths at the same time, we have to be aware that they're not a literally a literal expression of, of the truth. They're rather another way of explaining things. And we also have to be very aware and very critical of the use of myths to reinforce the existing social order and to try to limit our understanding of what constitutes our potentiality as a species being. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of dialectic there too, I think. Thank you very much for that, Dan. Um, I want to ask another question before we go to some of the questions from uh, our viewers tonight. And that's, um, I guess, in some ways, the ecology of freedom, and some people would certainly describe it in this way, is a theory, a paradigm, or, an, or, or a, I guess, proposal of a society built around built around and based on solidarity and what i wanted to what the question i wanted to ask was particularly um considering we've been in a pandemic for a year and a half and i mean hopefully it'll be ending soon but also it it we're we're still very much in a pandemic state of being um but especially at the height of uh, lockdowns and the pandemic, there was a lot of mutual aid groups and uh, solidarity groups that popped up all around the world. And actually, personally, I was quite surprised at how quickly they popped up. And in some ways, I don't really want to get into a discussion about you know human instincts and so on. But considering that this, in some ways, was seemingly a bit of a reflex of people, what do you think this last year and a half says about the possibilities of, you know, kind of reorganizing society um, in an ecological and in a and and in a free way. Because a lot of again, there's a lot of discussion and a, a lot of um, a lot of I guess uh, proposals around. You know, we need to create a new normal, or let's not go back to whatever considered was normal before it was never normal so yeah what what kind of possibilities do you think in a practical sense um it the last 18 months kind of arises for an ecology of freedom particularly in practice and uh should we start with you debbie sure thank you um, I, it's, it has been an absolutely fascinating period and it's not a surprise that a lot of people are saying wow we don't we don't want to go back to you know uh my work job 40 hours a week or from the united states anyway uh after say working at home and doing other things or not working at all you know um it's been quite an interesting moment in some ways i think when we look back at it it might have you know uh um, sort of be a moment similar to i mean not as wildly revolutionary as, for example, May, June 68 Paris or the 1960s in general, but I think it can certainly be, and it will be, turn out to be, if we reflect on it, a very important time and a place in which, a time in which people have really sort of been rethinking what it means to be alive, what it means to work, what it means to be a social creature. Since we've all been interacting on Zoom and other and other media, it, you know, there's certainly a sense that that people desperately need to take back some of that sort of um, so the social in a new way. You know, uh, I, I think it's been fascinating, as you said, Elif, that these mutual aid uh, groups have developed and 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 it, it's really one has to give huge credit to people you know because they're really people on the left who have been doing this um, and yet at the same time I think that it shows that it's really more important than ever that we begin to find ways 
to institutionalize these concepts of cooperation, of mutual aid, of solidarity, and that it's not enough just to do sort of to build cooperatives, say, um, you know, food cooperatives or to deliver food to people who need it, that we have to uh, do here again what, what my dad sort of tried to project out into the world. We have to start to build institutions where people find ways of associating in which they're not only helping themselves economically, but also politically changing the world. So kind of from, you know, from inside out and by and doing that. And he felt that the way to do that was through face to face association. Now, of course, in the middle of a pandemic, you can't, but there are other First of all, eventually the pandemic will end, but also there are ways, you know, in which people can start to think about what they want their neighborhoods to look like and their cities and their towns. And start for him, the critical effort was around popular assemblies. We start to get people together to talk to face to face and to try and really change the nature of politics. So that's really something that we do for ourselves rather than just electing somebody, even a progressive somebody into some state office, but rather make politics something that's uh, you know, transparent and accountable and that really is responsive to the base. So I think that this moment has been really important. It's obviously been very hard for a lot of people and many given us time to kind of reckon a little bit more with what kind what what kinds of relationships are meaningful and how we can start to begin to institutionalize those kinds of activities so that we can make these forms of solidarity much more permanent. And I'll just say one thing, you know, I remember that in New York City where I was born and have lived a lot of my life, uh, after there was, there was a giant storm called Superstorm Sandy, again, there was a lot of mutual aid that developed, but after several months, well, maybe up to a year, it kind of dissipated. And the, and the trick now for us is to try and actually really give institutional form to these things so that they become lasting. Thank you very much, Debbie. And Dan, do you want to have a go at this question? You're on mute, I'm afraid. I, I was very heartened to see the emergence of these mutual aid groups. Uh, certainly, I share a lot of Debbie's concern for the limitations of the form that they took, but I think that they existed at all, that they seemingly developed in a fairly spontaneous way. Uh, is extremely important because it, it gives gives the lie to that very narrowly defined vision of what constitutes human nature uh, that that we've been inculcated in in our current society because it shows us that you know certainly undeniably uh, people have the capacity to be individualistic to be selfish to be greedy to be acquisitive to be hoarders and in fact that's celebrated in our society. You know, in the U.S., we had probably the, the biggest grifter to ever live, elected president of the United States. So obviously some people admire those qualities, but uh, nonetheless, what the emergence of these mutual aid groups showed is that in addition to that potential, that set of possibilities, the human potential is much broader and it does contain the ability for us to be mutualistic, for us to be nurturing, for us to be caring, for us to be sharing. And these are things that we're aware of. These are kinds of relationships that exist within families and friendship groups, but to see them extended out into the larger community outside of those limited social realms of the nuclear family or your small group of friends, to see them become community-wide efforts, uh, to me was another point of inspiration, uh, a way for us to begin to get a sense of what really exists on the other side of these very, very constricted social roles that we find ourselves in today. It was an attempt to transcend the given. And interestingly enough, uh, these efforts were very effective. I mean, I remember also uh, Sandy and the mutual aid efforts that emerged after that in New York. And it turns out that they were much more effective than the Red Cross and the official institutions and actually getting aid to people and helping people. Uh, you know, without that kind of bureaucratic intervention, people were able to really be much more effective. Uh, and, and I share Debbie's concern though, that these are fleeting efforts. You know, I remember uh, 
Occupy Wall Street. I was in Zuccotti Park on the very first day and everyone was really excited and they were throwing around this notion that, uh, what's his name, Hakim Bey developed the, the idea of temporary autonomous zones. Well, you know, that's a festival of the oppressed. It's, it's a great thing. It's, it's a great educational moment for people. It's celebratory, it's joyous, but it's transient. And I don't want to see temporary autonomous zones. I want to see permanent autonomous zones. And in order to achieve that, we have to institutionalize these kinds of relationships. We have to give form to freedom. And we have to be prepared not just to create those forms, but to defend them and expand them as well. And for me, uh, you know, as someone who believes in the possibility of revolution, uh, that's the way I see it happening to be quite honest. I see it occurring through those kinds of collective processes that become institutionalized and can begin to create a counter power to the state and capitalism and ultimately to contest for power with them. So uh, yeah, I'm all for mutual aid. I think it's great. And it was ironic because, you know, a lot of, there were a lot of stories in the popular press, at least in the States about mutual aid groups and hardly any of them, if any that I saw at all, actually. Um, reflection mentioned sort of the, the anarchist roots of the concept, you know, this uh, term was coined by Kropotka back in the 1890s. So, so that was uh, also, I think, reveals something about the lack of historical memory in our society. Thank you for that, Dan. And David? It's very hard to follow these eloquent and lovely and wistful reflections. <laughs> I wish you'd come to me first. Um, I think I've been struck by how completely juxtaposed the assessments by pundits and historians and people trying to people in my sort of line of work trying to offer some sort of big perspective on what's been going on for the last year or two, coming to diametrically opposed views in print almost on a weekly basis. Somebody says, oh, it's all just going to entrench the, uh, the deep structural inequalities and we're, you know, we're clearly heading off a cliff and we're just going to head off a bit faster. And then, you know, the next day you'll read about how actually it's going to be this great leveler and if one looks at the broad sweep of history it's things like this that open up new possibilities so I, th I think the, f the mere fact that you've got people so confused about where we are right now in itself admits a certain sort of creativity what worries me personally considering that we're talking about freedom and the ecology of freedom is and and I think Dan put it beautifully in, in talking about our capacity to give form to freedom, which I'll try and come back to in a moment. What concerns me though is how, uh, as a direct consequence of the pandemic, the language of freedom has been debased and degraded to such an extraordinary degree. I mean, here in the UK, we've got these little attempts at political figures and sort of pseudo-political parties popping up on the basis of the most trivial and stupid freedoms one can conceivably, you know, effectively the freedom to infect your own grandmother with a deadly disease. Yeah, you know, let's all get behind that. Um, and it's the, the word is freedom. You know, this is, this is the word that's being bandied about. And I don't think this is an accident. I think people who hate freedom and are afraid of freedom know perfectly well that this is a, a well-tried strategy. It's been used many times in modern history. Drag the concept of freedom to the mud and eventually you'll get what you really want, which is some form of tyranny. So I'm wary of um, what's happened to freedom and equally of the need to rehabilitate uh, the term and the concept. And it's one of the things we tried to do in the book is to actually outline three what we consider very basic elementary forms of human freedom which were taken for granted by most people until fairly recently in, in the larger sort of scope of human history and those are simply uh, the first freedom um, is the freedom to move away from your current situation which of course also implies 
hospitality on the other side and the idea that there's somebody elsewhere who's willing to take you in and, and, uh, and uh, value you and care for you. The second freedom is simply the freedom to disobey arbitrary commands and authority. And the third freedom, which is in a way the, the most important, is uh, the freedom to create uh, different forms of society, or as Dan uh, put it, uh, to give form to freedom itself. And I think this goes back to the issue of the creativity of myth, because I think one of the more disastrous uh, consequences of the social scientific myths that we've been lumbered with for such a long time now is that they do down the very possibility of creativity. So in a way, it's a, it's a double, you know, it's, it's got multiple layers in a, in a sense, it's creativity itself or our capacity to be socially creative that's at stake here. So if history can, uh, in a way, re-energize, let's say, uh, re-mythologize, re-energize our sense of possibility, um, then I don't think it matters whether one calls it a myth or a, a form of science. Uh, so long as it's actually grounded, um, which uh, I think it, it is and, and, and it can be. It's the other stuff that's a fiction, uh, the idea that we are effectively doomed to tinker around the edges of what we've got now. Thank you for that, David. Um, so I'm going to go to some of the questions from our viewers. And there, there was a couple that um, I think were already addressed, but I'll just read them out just so they're acknowledged. Uh, but someone asked, as Bookchin was drawing upon early anthropological tradition, would David Wengro change add to his work? And I think you've already, um, you've already spoken to that, David, but... Um, well, I mean, the, I guess the, the obvious point to make is that he would change and add to his work because he would be reading all of the anthropological literature that's come out since, uh, you know, the 1980s, 1990s. So, um, um, clearly, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And someone asked, so there's two questions which I think could be answered um, together or kind of related um, and someone asks is there a danger in Bookchin's work of romanticizing pre-literate societies and there's another question uh, that is actually directly to Dan so Dan maybe we'll go to you first on this one is how book how was Bookchin influenced by Hegel in formulating his dialectic dialectic of freedom and domination so yes yeah, should we start with you on that one Dan You're on mute again, I'm afraid. Sorry, uh, I'm not a philosopher and I'm not a Hegelian, so I can't speak with great authority to the second part of the question. But my understanding is uh, Bookchin was deeply influenced by Hegel. He was a, he was a Hegelian. He was a, studied Hegel's work in great depth. Uh, and he developed a, his, di his own dialectic, which he saw as naturalistic, uh, the dialectics of nature. And he really saw it almost in opposition to the idealism of Hegel. He saw it as very much rooted in nature here and now. And dialectical naturalism was the term that he gave it. If people really have an interest in understanding it better, I would steer them towards a book he wrote called The Philosophy of Social Ecology, where he goes into great depth on that. Um, uh, you know, I think there is a danger always of, of romanticizing organic society. And that's actually, I think, what Bookchin uh, addressed in his second edition of The Ecology of Freedom, where he revised the introduction considerably because what he saw going on in society was just that, a romanticization and a valorization of preliterate society, organic society, uh, that was both unrealistic and he thought destructive. 
in part because there was tremendous, it, it was a kind of a cultural imperialism going on where white people were doing sun dances and studying shamanism and appropriating various aspects of organic society. And he was appalled by that. Uh, so I think he, he revised his view there. So, so it is a danger, but I think it's also important to recognize that uh, in his discussion of organic societies, he was really dealing more in a paradigmatic nature uh, with those societies than trying to depict the on the ground reality of any given one. He was looking at the principles that animated them, things like usufruct and, and uh, other kinds of property relations or lack of property relations, the idea of the irreducible minimum, these very important principles that animated those societies. And that was what he wanted to emphasize. And in doing so, he constructed an ideal type rather than trying to present any given on the ground culture as representing all of those aspects. So it's, you know, it's tricky, but I think certainly if, if one reads the book uh, critically, one can see where he's making those distinctions. Thank you very much for that, Dan. Um, we also have another question from a viewer, which is asking, I found Bookchin's use of the term equality of unequals as opposed to inequality of equals fascinating, but also challenging to understand in full. Could the speakers elaborate on this point? Uh, Debbie, should we go to you on this one first? Um, it's a, <laughs> probably Dan can do a better job on this, but you know, one of the things that that he and, and in terms of the terminology, inequality of equals versus equality of unequals. Um, I'm not enough of a linguist to <laughs> parse it out, but, but you know, what he was concerned about, and just to sort of pick up a little bit on what Dan was just saying, is, is that, you know, in our society right now, um, we have this idea somehow that everybody starts off with exactly the same opportunities. And by God, if you make it, you know, it just shows that you're self-motivated and you're, you can go for it. And, and, you know, one of the themes that goes throughout the ecology of freedom is that obviously you have to start from reality. And the reality is that people come into this world with all kinds of different abilities, sometimes with, uh, you know, physical infirmities, sometimes that age, that, that all kinds of things can affect how people are in a system that sort of starts from this idea of some kind of equal ground zero, uh, you know, and then we all claw our way to the top is just absurd. And as Dan said, you know, we have a president or had a president who exactly embodied that. And, and we see where that, that left us, you know, for, for my father, I, and again, this sort of goes back to Hegel, there's this idea that, uh, you know, everything is, in process, that you cannot see things statically, that things are constantly in motion, that there is a dialectic, that it's not a teleological outcome, that there's no guarantee about what the outcome will be, but that we look at each sort of consideration, uh, each social issue from the standpoint, not just of how it exists, but of what it could be. And moreover, sort of philosophically, again, as he elaborates in the philosophy of sociology, as how we as human beings are uniquely situated to intervene in the natural world and in the social world to create a rational society. So I think that um, that, that is a really important theme that goes throughout the ecology of freedom and that, and that in some sense, as, as I said earlier, uh, forms the kind of foundation of, of what he tried to eventually really develop as an ethics, an ecological ethics. Thank you very much. Uh, David, do you want to give this question a go? Well, I guess I'm, I'm reflecting on how that 
inversion of equals and unequals. So, I mean, it seems like a mental game one could play in a way to expose the, the ludicrousness of the whole idea of uh, a society of equals or what, what that could ever really look like. And I, I guess it may link in some way to what, what I think Mari Bookchin referred to as a gestalt form of society in which difference is taken for granted. Debbie says this is you know, a simple fact of, uh, of human existence, but in which those differences are not ranked um, in some predetermined way. And actually, um, I believe he, he was interested in ethnographers, anthropologists like Paul Radin, uh, who somebody mentioned earlier, precisely because they they paid attention to the, the psychological quirks and eccentricities to be found in all societies, uh, not just modern industrial ones, uh, including cases where, you know, it was impossible to find people who, by virtue of their cognitive or motor differences would be classified as a, a village idiot or a moron or, you know, um, the, there are actually societies which uh, long uh, before our own have, um, have conceived of difference in other ways. Um, there was a nice book by an anthropologist who I think was a student of Colin Turnbull, a guy called Richard Roy Grinker, called... Um, what was it, Undifferent Minds or something like that about autism, where he tries to go into the different permutations of autism in different social and cultural contexts. Uh, un unstrange Minds, I think it's called Unstrange Minds. It's an anthropologist perspective. And this is obviously just a much more grounded and empirical and realistic way to start thinking about human societies. And of course, we're not the first ones to do it, but we may be the first ones to pretend that it's not necessary or to imagine that one can begin from some fictitious state of equals where these kinds of differences simply don't exist. Um, beyond that, I'm afraid it's too long since I read the book to comment in any intelligent way on what the distinction is. Thank you very much, David. And Dan? Yes. Uh, well, I think, you know, he's really making a contrast between contemporary society, which, as Debbie explained, <clears throat> claims that we are all equal, but in which we are all painfully aware tremendous inequalities of all sorts exist, economic, social, access to resources, uh, you know, there's a whole litany of inequalities that one could enumerate and contrast that to, or once again, I'll use the phrase organic society and recognizing that this is a paradigm and not necessarily a particular case he's referring to, but th there, uh, there is a recognition of unequality, that we are all individuals with individual strengths, individual weaknesses, uh, some of us are born with what in our society would be termed disabilities or deficiencies. Uh, but despite that, in these societies, in these cultures, a way is found to integrate them into the culture to become fully functioning members who have the same access to food, clothing, shelter, the necessities of life as anyone else in the community. And that is the equality of unequals as opposed to the inequality of equals, which is the current state of being in our society. Now, that would be the, the simplest way I would find to explain it. Thank you very much. Um, there is another question and we don't have that much time. So if possible, um, maybe just, I mean, it's probably not possible for this question, but maybe just very short answers. Um, the question is, the distinction between objective and instrumental rationalism by Bookchin was interesting. Is there danger of his objective rationalism succumbing to the way he critiques mythology, religion? And I suppose we'll go to you on that one, Dan, and then wrap up afterwards. Yeah, I would say, of course, there is a danger. Um, you know, there's a danger with everything, even with the best intentions. Uh, 
your ideas can be misinterpreted or can be taken to a place you didn't intend, just as there's a danger that even, you know, institutions that we would generally approve of, like co-ops, can be co-opted. Uh, this society has the ability, and capitalism in general, has the ability to co-opt almost anything. It's the most adaptable system the world has ever seen in that sense. Uh, if there's a profit to be made, certainly. In the realm of ideas, uh, there's always a danger of misinterpretation and rationality is a very good example. It's a term that's used and defined in many different ways. And he makes the distinction between instrumental rationality and what he sees as true rationality, which involves not just logic, but also intuition and sensitivity to aspects that may not be apparent to begin with. So, yeah, I'd say there's a danger, but the way that one avoids those dangers, be it your co-op being co-opted or your ideas being misinterpreted, is by entering into the conversation with an awareness of that possibility. And at every point, clarifying your underlying principles and putting forth your particular definition of what it is you mean. And I think he does that quite successfully. Um, but yes, it could be misinterpreted and it could be uh, you know, used in a way that it wasn't intended. Thank you very much for that, Dan. Um, I mean, thank you very much, Debbie. Thank you very much, David, for uh, joining the Left Book Club in this discussion on Murray Bookchin's Ecology of Freedom. Um, I mean, it's been really inspiring. And again, we could go on for hours and hours and would still need more hours and hours to discuss um, the Ecology of Freedom and all the ideas um, and possibilities around it. But for tonight, we have come to an end. And just as a reminder, please visit theleftbookclub.com if you want to become a member and follow The Left Book Club on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And while you're here on the YouTube, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Our next event will be in August, so a bit of a holiday for uh, events. And that will be a book, a discussion about on Jason Hickel's book, The Divide. Where in which he will be joining us too. So look out for that and stay tuned for the details and the date and how to register for it. And once again, thank you very much to everyone who joined us, who engaged in the discussion, who asked questions. And thank you again, Dan, Debbie and David for joining us tonight and have a good night or a good morning wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks.